You're listening to the OCD Stories podcast, hosted by me, Stuart Ralph. The OCD Stories is a podcast dedicated to raising awareness and understanding around obsessive compulsive symptoms. I do this through interviewing inspired therapists, psychologists, and people who have experienced OCD. Welcome to the OCD Stories. And welcome to this midweek episode of the OCD Stories podcast. And in this one, I got back on Dr. Katia Moritz, who co-founded the Neurobehavioral Institute in Florida. And joining her is advocates Ethan Smith and Kyle King. So both Ethan and Kyle received treatment at MBI, and Katia was their therapist. So I wanted to get them all on to share their OCD stories, but then also to get Katia's um side of things her perspective uh, her view of it so there'll be the therapist and the client perspectives of two OCD stories today which isn't something I've really done before so in this we discuss Ethan and Kyle's OCD story their recovery process stories from their therapy sessions Katia's thoughts from her perspective they all share mutual stories from their therapy processes and much more and these midweek special episodes, which go out at the end of the month on a Wednesday, are made possible by and in partnership with the Neurobehavioral Institute in Florida, or MBI for short. I will be interviewing different members of their clinical team on a range of topics. MBI specialize in treatment and programs for anxiety, OCD, comorbidities, and complex cases. They also offer an intensive outpatient program and a residential program called the MBI Ranch. A supportive living experience that complements intensive treatment for anxiety and obsessive compulsive related disorders. To find out more about their intensive outpatient services or the MBI Ranch, as well as to read some of their free information online about OCD via their blog, visit mbiwestern.com. So thank you so much to Katia, Kyle and Ethan for their time. I deeply appreciate it and I enjoyed this conversation. And of course, thank you to you guys. As always, it means a lot. And without further ado, here they are. Welcome back to Katya and Ethan, and welcome to the show, Kyle. Thank you. Hey, thanks for having me. There's a three-way pause there. Um, so uh, today we're going to be talking about your OCD stories and your journey with with therapy. And obviously Katya's here because she was both of your therapists at MBI. Um, so hopefully there's there's two sides of the story here we'll, we'll be telling um so initially um it'll be good you know in three to five minutes just to i know it's really hard to do that but share your ocd story so i don't know if even you want to go first or kyle you want to go first uh, kyle do you want to start i was going to say you because i took like inspiration from you so oh so, okay stop all right so yeah so <laughs> You know, um, as far back as re- as I can remember, um, I was experiencing OCD thoughts. I don't remember, you know, as, as soon as I reached consciousness at the age of, you know, um, two, uh, I was having intense thoughts. Uh, my first thoughts were, you know, in kindergarten, worrying that my mom would go blind because she would stare at the sun during an eclipse or that I would swallow a fly and that my head would explode. There were large flies walking into school. Um, and, you know, it continued to manifest in, 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 in lots of different ways as I was I would say a toddler and moving into my er, later early years um, with symmetry and emetophobia and um, and really a lot of fear around my mom dying and what I could do to control that. And um, and I like to say that I was born sort of, unfortunately for OCD and getting better from OCD, I was born like in the void where it was like, you know, it was emerging as a science and like something we should pay attention to, but it really wasn't out there yet. Um, and so, and so it was, I guess it was a little better, obviously, you know, than had I been born in the forties or fifties or sixties. But, um, by the time I reached high school, my OCD really started manifesting as health anxiety. And at the time they called it hypochondria, uh, hypochondria or hypochondriasis. And so for me, I would get a headache. I thought it was a brain tumor. I would get fever. I thought it was meningitis. I was so terrified of getting sick. I would walk around with multiple thermometers and take my temperature hundreds of times a day just to make sure that I was okay go to the doctors over and over again to get reassurance that nothing was happening to me. Um, and, uh, and also, you know, also being afraid that something's going to happen to me or to my family and that I wouldn't be able to see them. So my ability to travel, to go away to school, even just simple things like senior trips or sleepaway camp, you know, I never did those things because I was so terrified. I tried and I would end up coming home like a day later. 
um, dropped out of college because of OCD. And as the years went by, um, my OCD progressed and got, you know, more worse. Uh, I think that it's important to highlight that I was diagnosed with OCD at 14 by a psychologist. Mm -hmm. um, and I had the diagnosis. Unfortunately, though, um, the treatment was talk therapy and psychodynamic therapy. And while it's a valid treatment for many things, as we know, for OCD, it is not. And so um, over the course of the next 17 years, I saw 10 different psych psychologists. I was on you know, multiple types of medication and constantly received different types of talk therapy. And I just got sicker and sicker. Um, I had a successful acting career in my 20s. Uh, however, my ability to function independently would diminish and my world was getting smaller and smaller um, until at about 30, um, I was completely bedridden and unable to function. Um, I couldn't eat. I couldn't drink. I was, at this time, my theme had shifted to so fear of self-harm. I didn't want to die. I, 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 wasn't, I wasn't having suicidal ideations. I was afraid I was going to accidentally hurt myself. Um, and so that's why I wasn't eating. I, I was afraid I was going to accidentally poison myself. Uh, so my parents had to feed me and I was basically living in their guest bedroom on unable to move. Um, I eventually, uh, things got so hairy for lack of a better word, just from emotional dysregulation that, um, I had to be put in a, a psychiatric hospital. I was there for three weeks. They diagnosed me as psychosis, psychotic. Um, it was not a wonderful experience at all. And after three weeks of being there and being stabilized medically, uh, pharmacologically, I should say. Um, you know, I got out and within two days I was back to everything, you know, and, um, my parents did some more outreach and turned out that there was a clinic 20 minutes away from my house and that clinic was NBI and Dr. Moritz. And so, uh, you know, I'll, I'll wrap up this piece of the story with, um, you know, I remember going in for the first time and, uh, sitting down with Dr. Moritz and Dr. Hoffman for an intake and they were, you know, they had a waiting list and they were busy, but they were like, we're going to figure it out and, you know, do intensive. And at the time they didn't, this was 2000, um, this was 2010. They didn't have a residential program. You know, the, the, the staff was considerably smaller. And, um, and I remember Katya explaining what the treatment is, exposure and response prevention, and that I'm a wonderful candidate for it. And what do I think? And I looked at her and I was like, F you, because it was like every therapist before that had said, we can help you. Hmm. And then after 10 therapists, why, why is what she's saying any different? You know, I don't know the modalities of treatment and she's saying I can help you. And I'd already heard it 10 times. So I was just like, no, you can't. And so that's what she had to work with a blank canvas of, of attitude around like, yeah, that's nice, whatever. And so that was my introduction to Dr. Moritz and kind of where I was at my stage. She saw me three days after I was out of the psychiatric hospital. Wow. Wow. Okay. Well, thank you for sharing that, Ethan. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Sure. And Katia, your your side of that, you know, that intake interview that even just mentioned, um, how do you convince someone when they're at that stage, you know, they're rightfully fed up, you know, because they just it hasn't worked. Everyone's kind of not intentionally lied to them, but in some way has. Uh, how do you convince Ethan or anyone else in that situation? Yeah. Well, before I answer that, Stu, I want to actually say that I'm very uh, touched by being here together with those two guys here. I know I'm going to regret this very badly. I'm already regretting it because I know I'm going to get it from them. But um, I am so um, touched and so, uh, you know, it's just like a, a, I'm so proud of them. And it, it feels so good to be here sharing stories of hope um, and being able to see them for who they are and not what the illness made them be. Um, and so for me, it's like, I can't even, I mean, it's like, I'm, I'm filled with joy about that. You know, it's just like, makes me so happy. Uh, and I know they're going to make fun of that too, but that's fine. I don't care. Uh, so, so I think the other part of it is uh, I just want to make sure that here, you know, um, as you mentioned, I was involved in the care before, and I just want to make sure you guys are okay with us talking about it. I'm just, you know, we can talk about anything, right? All good. Okay, I have your consent. Thank you. Um, and so I'm going to just say also that I'm no longer engaged in, with them uh, clinically uh, for many, many, uh, many years. And and uh, the only thing I do is now they are part of my community, which is a very interesting thing because a lot of the people that we treated in the past became kind of like part of our world. And they are in a way like uh, uh, doing things parallel to our work and presenting with us and doing things. And so it's so, so exciting to see. And for me, that's what shows people that they need to get help. 
um, because there's another side to this uh, bridge, right? That scary bridge that we'd say we need to cross on the other side is so much better. Um, and life, no matter, even the worst day of regular life, is better than a good OCD day where you're like compulsing and, and dealing with OCD, right? So I think now you guys believe me, both of you didn't believe it then, um, but but what it is to treat someone who shows up and eat them look like the caveman, I kid you not. I will tell you word by word what happened that day, but he had big hair, and the nails were this long. Literally, he looked like the caveman. Um, it is the saddest thing to see because... It, there were glimpses of the person behind that whole kind of distraught presentation. And we could see that there was something there so special that the illness was taking away from all of us and from his family and from himself, right? And so the idea with that is very complex, which is, I would say that, you know, more and more is getting more difficult to do. And I think that patients uh, that inspired us to create a bigger clinic or to do more intensive or have a residential support is, is a lot to do with this because um, it is so difficult to break away and to really free yourself from the, you know, that like squeeze from OCD. Um, and so how do we convince someone? I think convincing is 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 difficult because convincing is is intellectual, right? And this is very physical. You have to help someone do it. So they start believing that they could do it. And in order to do that, you may actually have to do very, very extreme and very pushy and very difficult things um, that more and more become difficult to do because as uh, the terrain changes in terms of how people think treatment should happen, you know, the more difficult it's going to be to treat those folks that are really, really stuck and struggling. Um, the same way as you would ask, you know, how do you do surgery and cut someone open and take, you know, something from inside of their body? It, it, it sounds like extreme, but OCD treatment at times is a lot like surgery and it needs to be, it's tough and it is, it, 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 it has to be brave and we ask them to be brave and we have to be brave, right? So it, it is a whole process, but it's also a process of never giving up. And I think that most patients have heard, I'm going to help you. Um, but unless the, te the, the techniques are there and you're really trying to uh, collaborate and, and teach them how to come with you on this journey, you know, um, it doesn't work. So, so you have to be patient sometimes. And this whole thing about like readiness for treatment, sometimes it's part of the treatment to get someone ready for treatment, you know, and if you don't do that, they may never get ready. So I know pe people who are now 40, 50, 60, and they never got treatment because they never got ready. So mm -hmm. Treatment is about getting ready also, you know? Yeah, really, really good point. Absolutely. Um, so Kyle, uh, your turn now. Yeah. Um, I think I spent the first three months getting ready for treatment while I was in treatment. Um, even hearing your story, I, I'm reminded of how similar we were um, in terms of like what we were like when we got to Moritz, but mine started out a bit different. Um, I was born. Um, and like for the majority of my life up until like age 11, um, I don't really remember having any particular intrusive thoughts or, um, experiencing anything like remotely similar to OCD. And then in the summer before my seventh grade, um, school year, I remember like, this is my first intrusive thought I can remember. I, I went to the library, I got a book. Um, and I just got this thought that like, I don't know who's touched this book. I don't know what's on this book. So I probably shouldn't touch this book. Um, and I, I was like, that's a weird thought. So I got the book anyways, and I started reading it. But when I put it down, my hands just felt different. Like they felt weird and like they'd been coated with something that I didn't understand. Um, so I started washing my hands after I touched this book. Um, and then I went on a, a vacation and I wanted to bring my book with me, but I didn't want it to touch any of my clothes. So I put it in a bag and kind of like buried that somewhere in my suitcase. And I didn't really know why I was doing any of this. And my parents noticed it, but they didn't say anything. Um, so this kind of went on with more and more library books. And eventually my parents were like, okay, something's up. Um, and they sent me to a talk therapist. Um, and she never gave me a formal diagnosis of, of anything in particular. Um, but we just kind of talked a little bit about what was going on in my head. And she said, well, you probably shouldn't wash your hands after you touch the book. Um, something like exposure therapy, just not as a, a vigorous, I guess, as Katya might do exposure therapy. Um, and I was like, yeah, I'll totally just not wash my hands. And then I would go home and touch the book and wash my hands. Um, 
because the the feelings were too strong at that time. Um, Mm. So that went on for probably two ish months. And then I got fed up with the therapist. I told my parents I didn't want to do it anymore. And then when I started seventh grade, I volunteered um, for a program at my school where I would help the children with autism try to learn throughout the day. Um, and the first day I went to the the class um, with the children with autism, I remember like working with them and getting this thought like, oh my God, what if I touch them and then I get autism? And I got really up in my head that I could somehow get autism. And the second I had that thought, I knew it was irrational, but I still had this weird feeling that like it could happen. Um, so I went home that day and that was the first time that like, I put my backpack down and thought, well, I probably shouldn't touch anything in my house because if I touch something in my house, then maybe I'll give that thing, the autism that's on me. And then if I touch it again, I'll get it back. So it was like my first magical contamination type thoughts. Um, and that went on for about a month. And for that month, I, 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 my world got increasingly, increasingly small, um, And then I think I was in North Carolina visiting my sister who's in college at the time. And I thought I saw someone with autism um, on the street and I got really scared and all of North Carolina felt contaminated. So for that vacation, I locked myself in a room in my sister's house and I didn't leave that room for two days. Um, And that's when my parents were like, okay, we need uh, this kid needs treatment. (laughs) So they took me to MBI and much like Ethan, the first time he saw Moritz, I was not open to it. Um, I was snarky. I think I was snarky for the first like year and a half, but <laughs> I was snarky for a while. Still, you're still snarky. What are you talking yeah. about? Yeah. Okay. That's also just kind of me, but I was additionally snarky then. Um, but I, I wasn't, I wasn't open to it. And I intellectually understood that my thoughts were irrational. And I intellectually understood that if I confronted them and didn't get autism, as I certainly would not, then I would probably be better, but I just didn't feel it. Um, and I didn't trust Moritz and I didn't want to go for it. And it didn't matter all the things that I knew to be true. It just, the feeling was the only thing that mattered. Um, so I would say for like three months, I was combative in treatment and I would do some exposures. I wouldn't do others. Um, I think I would compulse immediately after I did the exposures that I did in front of Moritz. And when I went home, I certainly didn't do any on my own. And I kept getting worse and worse and worse until in like the middle ish of seventh grade, I like I couldn't wear any of my clothes and I could hardly leave my room. If I did, I couldn't really leave my house. I was still going to school, but I couldn't sit in any chairs and I couldn't use a pencil. And I would just kind of like wander in the rooms that I was supposed to be in, not paying any attention, only thinking about all the risks risks I was taking on by being out of my house and out of my room and in my clothes and doing anything. Mm -hmm. Um, And I don't know. uh, I used a phrase in treatment called uh, where I said I like cracked the nut and that was supposed to be like, I cracked my OCD. I don't know like the exact moment that something changed in my brain. I don't, as I thought more and more about my journey, I don't know if there was like an exact moment. Um, But eventually I think I started to like look at what my life had become and what, my parent, how, how my parents were suffering because of all that I was going through and how, how I had lost the life that I had once had. Um, Mm. and I started to trust Marich just a little bit. Um, and it, (laughs) it also took a lot of her forcing me to like, forcing me to do things that I didn't really want to do, um, for, to, to help me through. Um, and I started doing it little by little and, I would say like over six or seven months, I got slowly and slowly and slowly better. Um, And eventually the harder exposures started to feel easy. And then the ones that I never thought I would ever be able to do started to feel easy. And then we went to a ranch out in Utah and um, I did a lot of fun exposures there. And I started to transition into like, um, I don't even know how it happened, but like someone who was helping other people with OCD. And it felt like, I I don't know. I just (laughs) with like, it felt like magic almost that I just kind of started to not be bugged by my OCD. And it certainly wasn't magic. It was a lot of hard work, but I think I just repressed the hell out of that. Um, (laughs) But yeah, that's, that's my journey in a nutshell. Yeah. Yeah, Thank you for sharing that, Carl. Um, 
I know it's hard for both of you or anyone to condense their story into like five minutes and it's taken yeah, so sorry, many years. That's why I didn't get, I didn't get, I didn't get into treatment. I, I divided it into half. And actually Kyle forgot to mention that we met at the camp in Utah. That's when I first met Kyle. I was there as a, uh, as sort of a guest, uh, guest encourager um, at that time. And I met Kyle and his mom and, and, and got to work with him. It was really cool. He's a good, he's a good guy. Yeah. Is, is this the MBI ranch? No. So, so before, even before the MBI ranch ranch was like a dream for like 20 some years. And, uh, but before we did that, um, we uh, actually brought all the families and the patients to Utah for a 10 day camp. And I actually went with them and we all lived in the same building and we did all the exposures and the activities together. And every activity had an exposure component and treatment component. So they would do exposures on the rope scores where you're super stressed and anxious uh, walking around. You still doing your exposures while you were at the height of the anxiety. So it was really, really cool. And it is a beautiful, beautiful setting. Um, And we did so many activities. So we had a winter camp and a summer camp. Um, and I think, uh, Kyle, you came to the summer camp, right? Yeah, it was surprisingly fun. It was surprisingly fun. Um, mm-hmm. and I have a lot of stories I could share about, like, you know, the, the, the guys in that and in, in that camp. But um, it was a moment where all your hardcore exposures naturally would happen. Right. So so I think both of you experienced really extreme you know, uh, camaraderie between the families that the parents were there, the siblings and the siblings were much, much harder to manage than th- those guys. Right? So there was like siblings and moms and dads and, you know, um, and, and so it was very interesting because we d- did get to experience what it is uh, for people to be in their house doing their exposures. And that's what reinforced us that we had to have the ranch because mm-hmm. traveling to Utah twice a year wasn't enough. And, and I would say that for a lot of the people, those 10 days were like, it felt like like three years of therapy in 10 days because at nighttime we would go like Kyle, remember everybody would go to Kyle's room and contaminate his bed, the entire group. So there were parents, there were kids in his bed. I mean, like we were all like messing with him at 1130. I get a, a knock on my door. It's like so-and-so is stuck. We would go there and unstuck them and get them going. And so all of a sudden, you know, it, it, we were able to experience what it is, the true support, the support that is needed sometimes to just break away. And I think that that's the experience. And I think that, uh, you know, we usually, uh, we still use the cracked the nut analogy that, that Kyle uh, coined that term at MBI, but like, I, I think we actually have a group that's called cracked the nut. And I think that, that, the, that the idea was that, sometimes you need to go somewhere and get the support you needed to really have the courage to take that big step, the leap of faith, the moment where we jump off the cliff and say, I'm going to do this. Right. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and uh, I think it happened for both uh, in a funny way. Ethan came as like a gasp, but then he had the funniest thing happen where he was in a little boat. <laughs> I have the video. It's hysterical. Um, and and they made me laugh more than I ever laughed before because they were doing this like battle, like 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 singing battle. And the other day I found the recordings of that and I cannot I could not stop laughing. They were so funny. Kyle and, and Ethan are so good at this. We need to do that one time again. I don't remember laughing that hard. So it was funny because it was exhausting. It was me and one or two other clinicians and it was so much work and it was so much preparation, but I had met, I had so much fun with them. They were so hysterical. And I think, and, and, and Kyle, I don't know if you remember, it was the first time that I think Kyle uh, realized that I was on his, uh, that, 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 that MBI on us, we were all on his side. Do you remember running after me? I was walking away from going to the horse area. And um, do you remember you were like a you're like a peanut at the time? <laughs> I don't remember that. I have this like, wonderful. Yeah, it was. Was that Ethan? Go ahead, Kyle. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I was just gonna say, like, I that was kind of the first time that like I was with you and like other clinicians, and I was like, oh, these people like they care about me. Like I I I intellectually knew it the whole time, but I was doing so much hard stuff with you that like every time I saw you, it was like, oh God, like it's, it's time to feel really bad all the time. Um, and then at, at, in Utah it was the first time I was like, okay, like, you know, me and me and Maritz can joke around and like, she 
she's a person and you know, she wants the best for me. I have this really beautiful memory of Kyle, actually. It was fun. And although I was in a place of maintenance and management, my OCD was well under control. Um, I wasn't very physically active. And so the entire week was really just an exposure for me, rock, rock climbing and doing all kinds of things out of my comfort zone. Um, but I will say, I remember um, this beautiful, as Kyle spoke about being afraid of, you know, catching autism. Um, we were we were inside of the of the lodge. I was complaining to the owner that the towels were too rough and that they needed softer towels in the bathrooms for showering because that's what I do. But I remember looking and there was a gentleman with Down syndrome that entered the building and and I watched Katya grab Kyle and push him over there and be like, meet can, can, can Kyle stay high and meet you? And I just remember looking over and they were shaking hands and they were hugging and you know, it was it was kind of this beautiful moment because I could see Kyle like kind of like just relinquish control and be like, yeah, if I get it, I get it. You know, if I catch this, I catch this. And at the same time, you know, the gentleman was just so happy to, you know, they're so loving and caring and they want to hug and they're affectionate. So they were exchanging this really affectionate glance and then watching Kyle re-engage in the activity after the fact and really like live into his values despite being really triggered in that moment. Yeah, it sticks out to me. So that's awesome. That's awesome. Um, and, and Kyle, you said there, you, you realized, and I'm, even I'm sure you had this moment too, um, where Katia and the people at MBI really cared. Um, what was it like, if you had to put words to it, what was it that really sealed it for you or made you, you see that or believe it? It was a combination of a lot of things. Um, I think it was like being in a, it was joking around with him and being friendly with the staff for the first time, but it was also like now that OCD didn't control the majority of my brain and I wasn't fully on board with the, with its constant, like telling me that I could catch autism. Like I could interact with someone with down syndrome and feel like, okay, I can feel this anxiety and compartmentalize it and continue doing what it is that I was doing before because OCD no longer controlled all my cognitions. I was able to see that like, you know, these people aren't fighting me. They they were fighting my OCD and they're continuing to fight my OCD, but that's not Kyle anymore. Kyle's this other person who has OCD and has gone through a lot and they've, you know, Kyle's been a lot, very anxious, but they were fighting something different and Kyle's left over after that. Mm, yeah, that makes sense. And then uh, Ethan, for you, um, obviously I'm sure you were very resistant to ERP as you've kind of already said. Uh, and probably maybe quite angry at, I don't know, I could be putting words in your mouth, but angry at the staff. Um, yeah. When did, when did it switch for you that you thought actually no, they're on my side? You know, I had an interesting journey. Go ahead. Stick. I was going to say, and not just because they're getting paid to be on my side. Yep. yep. I call them renter friends. <laughs> I was like, I always felt like, you know, this is they're my renter friends. Um, you know, I had a very different experience in treatment and, um, you know, the first thing I want to say, because I think Katia touched on how much treatment has evolved. So I actually want to give a caveat on behalf of her, which was, and this is where her bravery and her team's bravery really came into play. And I know she doesn't like to take credit. She makes it about us. But, you know, I don't entirely agree with her with that. She deserves a lot of credit in her team. Um, I want to make it very clear that when I walked in there and honestly, the entire time I was at NBI before I even went to residential, you know, ERPs are all about consent. Like you always hear, we would never ask you to do, you know, if you don't want to do it, then we don't do it, right? That's kind of the cardinal. I can tell you without a fact that I wouldn't have done any ERP if they gave me the choice, period. I would not have said yes. I would have not have done it. I would have sat there. And so Kathy is, so I want to make that very clear that the, 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 the treatment has evolved and changed, right? And it's, I can tell you that Without the way Katya and her team approached me, I would not have gotten better, period. So there were a lot of, so with that caveat, you know, there were a lot of creative ERPs that they kind of had to do to work around me. So they had to do it, you know, so for instance, you know, I was terrified of my parents leaving and something happening. So I remember I was going to the dentist. The first thing was to get my like life back together. So I was going to the dentist, getting cavities filled because I hadn't brushed my teeth in three years. And I came back to the office. And Kati is like, okay, so you're going to go home. Oh, by the way, your parents are out of town. They're, they're gone for a week. And I was like, what? 
oh yeah. And I broke down, but it like, that's the kind of stuff that was necessary for me because I never would, if they'd sat down and said, Ethan, is it okay if your parents go out of town? There's no way I would have ever agreed to it ever, ever, ever. Mm -hmm. So it was that kind of creativity. It was necessary. And hopefully copy. I I frame that caveat carefully um, for you. What I will say is for me, treatment, you know, I was at NBI for eight months. I was at five sessions a day, five days a week. I mean, they didn't have an intensive program. They created something for me and for other people. Um, I was very, very resistant. And, 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 you know, I would say probably got 10% better during that time. A lot of that was because I was still living at home. My parents, it was very hard for them not to reassure and enable. And, and, you know, even though my parents would would verbally say to me the things that Katya would say to me, their actions were the opposite. So, you know, Katya would tell my parents to say like, we don't love you. So my mom would say, Ethan, we don't love you, but do you want to come over for dinner tonight? You know, it's like, you know, it was what they said and what they did were two different things, right? So it was very evident that from Katya's perspective, from a strategy, it was like, let's get Ethan to a place where he could potentially thrive in a more acute setting, in a residential setting. And that became the goal. Um, so long story short, um, I ended up going to to the OCDI in Boston. And it was the first time I remember I was maybe there two days. I don't want to steal Katya's story, but um, I was there two days and they were like, we can't handle this guy. He's a mess. And they called Katya. And it became this amazing relationship between Katya and the team up there where everybody started collaborating, which like cross facility collaboration is was kind of a very new thing that just didn't happen. And I'll let Katya speak to more on that. Um, it took, after two and a half months being there, I was still very resistant and I had done, you know, exposures. And I finally, I'm getting to your, uh, answering your question. It was just kind of a, you know, I, 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 I did this, this thing where I faked an accident and then dove in a snow bank and hurt, you know, hurt my head so I could get a CAT scan to make sure that my brain was okay. And after I did that, um, you know, I, I eventually confessed to it and I was getting kicked out of the OCDI. And it was at that point that I, it was that, at that point that I truly, I gave up on myself hundred percent. I was like, mm. there's nothing that can be done. And I don't mean that I wanted to die, but I was like, and I remember sitting in the room and they were trying to determine what my next step was. And I, I don't know that I ever told this to Katya. I'll get emotional. But, and I remember Katya, and this was where kind of my intervention came in, where really tough love came into play. But I remember Katya saying, we've got a plan. And the plan was horrendous. Like, you need to live in Boston. You need to cut yourself off from your parents. You were selling all your stuff. Um but something I've never spoken about this. I don't know. Something deep down when she said we've got a plan was like, holy crap, she's not giving up on me. Hmm. Like after all I've put her through, you know, eight months of fighting her, two and a half months of fighting residential. And then after all this therapy and all this time, I I, I do this crazy stunt. You know, and like I had just given up on myself. I was like, there's no hope. And she was like, we'll figure something out. And of course, in retrospect, it's like that was the moment for me that I realized that she was on my side. And it wasn't that I didn't realize it before, just the OCD was so prevalent and pervasive that it was like I, I couldn't, I didn't have that kind of insight and objectivity. And even though life got worse before it got better after that point, I realized that. How could I, I didn't understand how she could continue to stick with me. I'd given her every reason not to. When in reality, my OCD had given her every reason not to, and I didn't realize that. So that was the moment that I realized that her and my whole team, everybody at the OCDI, they were all behind me and I they were they were with me. Yeah. I, I was I gonna make a point, uh, Sue, about care, because I think that people like the modern way that people are thinking about care um is actually a, a concerning thing because care is not about making someone feel good today or feel comfortable today. It is about building a life. So if you have a car accident and you hurt your legs, uh, physical therapy may be very painful, but you can't try to not make it painful because it's painful. So because the outcome is not going to be what you want. And so my concern about this 
kind of uh, concern about how difficult treatment is, is not consider how difficult the illness is. So, you know, like right now, the power of, of your interventions sometimes, they are really difficult. And I think that Kyle and, and Ethan speaks beautifully about how difficult it was, uh, but without the power of intervention and actually the courage of intervention, which is very hard because we all have a heart and we all feel sad for them and we all feel the pain. Um, but if we don't have the courage to really help them through and know how to measure, I think it's the measuring that is really important. If you do so, too harsh of a, an intervention, you're going to break it. And if you do it too soft, which I believe now a lot of it is validation and reassurance and all of that, and just very cognitive and everything, what happens is the condition doesn't have a, a place to break. And mm -hmm. and what I kind of, uh, you know, Ethan was between going to a nursing home and having the rest of his life locked up into a nursing home, which he would have gotten kicked out of. Because I was thinking, like, which nursing home is going to take the stunts that Ethan is pulling? Like, it was nothing for him out there. And I think in, in terms of Kyle, it was like, you know, you know, this kid is so smart, but he's using all his smarts to protect his illness. And here his illness is becoming like, you know, kryptonite. And he's feeding the freaking kryptonite and feeding it and feeding it. And his life is you know, literally becoming smaller and smaller, right? And 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 I and I I would say though that care is not about care is really whatever it takes, and whatever it takes may not be what it, you feel you want in the moment. No one wants to go to surgery. Who wants to get a heart transplant? But if you say that you you have to do a heart transplant, but people can't feel anything and they can't experience any distress. Then there's no heart transplant. And then there's a lot of people for the rest of their lives not getting better. Right. So I think understanding that unfortunately, we still haven't, science hasn't caught up with a way to treat those uh, hardcore cases of OCD with talk therapy or some form of like soft and understanding of the symptoms. Kyle and Ethan had a hundred percent insight, understanding. They knew it was. You know, they would say, this is ridiculous. You, This is great. I know this makes no sense. So it wasn't about understanding. You could talk to them. But in the moment, they couldn't break the spell. It, they were really like, it was like, you could see in our, you know, that, that spell, like you can't break it, right? And so, you know, to be unpopular is something that clinicians sometimes feel that, oh my God, they're going to hate me. They're going to give me bad reviews. Even now, so with bad reviews, people are so afraid of bad reviews. I think it's kind of like a badge of honor, right? A bit, you know, if you get bad reviews or if you get patients upset, not upset because you did something wrong, of course, but that you actually stood by your techniques and helped them. I'm telling you that there's going to be that bridge you're going to cross with them. Eventually they're going to look back and say, wow, this person had courage. This person helped me. And so for clinicians out there, recognizing that it's uncomfortable as a clinician to see someone feeling uncomfortable, to create discomfort, you know, but you have to look a little bit of ahead. What comes next? Yeah. Right. So, you know what I mean? Yeah. Do, you raise, Stu, do you mind if I go ahead? Well, just one quick thing. Even. I mean, Katya, you raise a really valid point. It's probably a discussion that needs to be had within the, the therapy community of, yeah, with those cases that are really, really tricky, what is the pressure that needs to be applied here or the dose of therapy medicine, so to speak, you know, because it might not be the soft, compassionate act approach or, you know, it might be much more we need to, as yeah. Ethan and Kyle have both it, said. You need you know. to weave that in. Like, so uh, yeah. all those third generation, you know, um, yeah. uh, third wave, like uh, uh, aspects of, of CBT are so important. I'm a, a, a hardcore behaviorist in mind too and, and love exposure therapy. I think exposure really still is the, the secret sauce in this whole thing. And well done exposure really is what emerges, you know, from like the brain changes emerges from that. Um, but but all those techniques are important. And actually, once someone is a little bit better, they really can use that technique to grow and develop for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. And I say that both Ethan and Kyle are, and others that went through a lot of uh, treatment and self-reflection, they're not just good at, at the OCD thing. They have become better in life. They actually have more tolerance. They have more resilience. And that's why both are very successful um, and they will be even more successful because they are resilient. They actually, you know, they fought their own brain. Mm -hmm. What, I mean, 
if you fight your own brain, like what it is to fight someone who's being annoying or, or a boss or a colleague or something, you're like, oh, this is, you know, I know I need I need to do I deal with OCD. I mean, I I, I could do this, right? Yeah. So I think that that's the outcome of treatment. It shouldn't be like, oh, this person knows how to manage their OCD symptoms. I think the beauty of the outcome of treatment is that that allows someone to really reflect on how to make themselves better prepared for the world that they're going to live in and 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 to to actualize their dreams right hmm. good points good point um and Ethan, you you were saying yeah i just wanted to toss something at katya what you said i want to give obviously kyle a chance to weigh in i mean let me let me go back which is for me and i didn't get into the piece where i really started to exponentially get better um katya is right i uh i, I could create a behavioral treatment plan for anyone with OCD at that time. I just didn't know how to apply it to myself. For me, um, acceptance, commitment, therapy, act really changed the game um, in terms of the relationship with my thoughts, how I perceive my thoughts, creating, it really helped rewire my brain in a way that I could then look at ERP and go, oh, that makes sense. So like act was the catalyst but had I not had any of the ERP background, I never would have gotten better. So, so it was like once ACT kick in, kicked in, then as I moved through life and living value every day, a little bit more, a little bit more, I was doing constant ERPs because I then understood the relationship. What I wanted to add to Katya's point, I'm not putting down because she's below me, but what I wanted to point to Katya and, and just give her a little bit of credit also is she spoke about you know, you go too hard, you break it, you go too soft, you don't. But the other piece of that, Katya, from a, from a clinical perspective that I almost wanted you to weigh on was timing. And, 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 and that's the other piece. It's like the timing, it's, you, it, it's a science, but it's an art and it's a nuance. And it's like, also, you're, you can't, you couldn't kick me out and, and tell my parents that I'm dead on day one, right? And, and, and like everything was so methodical and planned. So I just wanted to throw out that it wasn't just, we can't go too hard. We can't go too soft, but timing was everything too. And so I just was curious to your thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, I, I think, you know, for all care, <clears throat> if people think that you go and see a patient and that's your day, uh, then, then you're really not seeing them. Right. I mean, I, I could go to stories and stories about both, you know, Kyle and Ethan, they're hysterical, um, which I, I may want to share a couple of them because I think that they are fantastic because people think, of the care from the patient side, but there's also the side of the clinician. And so for us, it was always about collaboration and uh, intellectual property, right? So talking about the case and talking about what to do, if I count how many hours uh, Ethan or Kyle's case or anyone else for that matter is discussed to be able to get to this timing and this approach, it's not like you on the spot and you're like, only creating. Yes, there's a lot of creativity, but there's so much preparation, right? And I mean, right now my team, we're, I think we have three and a half hours, almost a day of like block times just for interactions and conversations, which just sound crazy. Like, what are you talking so much about? But it is so difficult to really time this correctly and put the right pressure. It's like almost the braces you wear. If you time the braces too much, it's going to pass the point and it's going to get crooked. And if you don't tighten in at all or enough, you're not going to have the teeth and the outcome you want. So that science of tightening something that is not physical, that is like very much like, you know, have so many variables and various, you know, it's very difficult. And so I, when people say, oh, exposure therapy, you could just read on a manual and do it. Congratulations to them. And I think it's the hardest thing ever. And, you know, we have a postdoctoral training program, um, you know, and people spend two years with us practicing that. And, and I tell you, they even say, oh, my gosh, this is so hard. I mean, learning how to do it is so difficult. It's so crafty. It's so like nuanced. Like you have to know the little nuances, like for me, like small movements that people do when they're trying to neutralize their exposures, like little things that could just be game changers. Right. And Ethan talks about interventions like so. Uh, the family uh, intervention, the parenting piece, 
if the parents are, are, are not involved, if Kyle's parents weren't amazing and learned so much and Ethan's parents weren't amazing and learned so much, I'm, I'm, I will question where we would be today because they play an incredible role in the way they change the way they approach this. Remember, those guys are smart. So if they are using that, that smart brain to kind of advocate for their conditions and manipulate the environment, they're sweet and they have those like, oh, faces – parents are going to fall for all those things and and it's so difficult for them so so i would say though that you know i think it's the community that makes it at work and it is about like families and parenting and patients and clinical and all of that and it's a partnership so for me like you know it's it's kind of of interesting because uh, the other day ethan's mom sent me a text you know i get texts all the time from I don't know. I mean, I get more texts from people I haven't seen in so long. Kylie, no, but you know, sometimes you did. Well, you were looking for an internship, right? And we'll talk about it. And that's, you know, it's, it's, it's that relationship, that knowledge that we are connected, you know, and we are connected even though someone actually, you know, like your, your personal trainer doesn't say to you, oh, don't worry, relax, just do breathing. You're not going to build muscles like that. You need to be pushed a little bit, and I think that mm. that, that 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 science of pushing at the right amount at the right time with this partnership is what makes the relationship forever. So I say to them all the time, like parents. Sometimes parents say, "Oh, the kids telling telling me they hate me. They don't hate you. They hate that you have to put them through whatever you're putting them through." But trust me, when they grow up, they look back and say, "Wow." This person was very special to me. So, so in that spirit, I mean, I have had interactions and experience with both Kyle and, and, and Ethan and others that reinforce that. You know, don't be so worried about, you know, being a therapist is not a rented friend. It's not to be friendly and for people to love you. Sometimes the the people that make you feel the most like uh, are because they're touching upon something really important for you. And sometimes we need to understand it's very different. You're not choosing to be friends. You're choosing to have someone to teach you techniques and tools that will impact the rest of your life. And maybe you don't love them. Maybe you never want to be friends with them. But if they're good at what they're doing, that's what matters, right? They need to be really focused on that. So I think I think those things about care, that's what care is about to me. Yeah. It really is. It's not about, you know, pleasing people, telling them what they want to hear, that their friends do that for them. I, I don't want to be friends. I, 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 I don't care. I want that help. And, and if you stay true to that, at the end of the day, people will recognize that you really did. You really had their be- best interest at heart. Yeah, really good point. Really good point. Absolutely. Um, so uh next question and Kyle, if you take this one, um, and then and then Ethan and then Katya get your response to it, is just um going through ERP, really. Obviously, we've already talked about when you were both resistant to it and then when it started to work. So I guess just to answer the question of like what was like literally in the trenches going through ERP like both in those two stages, you know, before it was okay and after it was okay. Okay. Um, not fun. Uh, <laughs> I think when, when I was uh, more resistant and this is something that this is like a story that kept coming to my head when um, Katya was talking about, like, I guess needing to be firm when you're an ERP clinician. Um, I, I was doing everything I could to like, I use my brain to trick Katya or trick any therapist or trick my parents into giving me reassurance or letting me get out of exposure. Um, and there's like, there was one time when I saw someone with autism walk out of MBI and I was about to walk in and I thought in my head, like, okay, I can't go in there. Like, I'm, I'm not going to walk into MBI today. And I thought if I like made this hard stand, that my mom would feel so bad that she would drive me home and Katya wasn't going to come out of her office and she wasn't going to like change the venue of therapy. Um, and I remember my mom got out of the car and walked away and she left me in the car, um, which probably was uh, the best for her um, to not have to see me struggle. And Katya came out and she was like, I, I told her I'm not going in. And I was probably like venomous and saying, I hate you. Like you're never going to bring me in there. And she just stayed out there the whole hour 
and was like, no, you're coming in. Like, I don't care. You're coming in. Like, I know it sucks. I know you're not going to like it, but we're coming, we're going in. Like we have a therapy session. And I, I was so convinced that if I like just made a stand and, and picked a hill to die on, she'd give up. Mm-hmm. Um, and she just did not give up. And I, I think, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be here and talking right now if she uh, gave up on me at any point. And I, I also thought that like, if I spit enough venom and was rude to her enough, <laughs> she'd like stop caring about me. Um, but she didn't, which I don't understand, but <laughs> I appreciate a lot. Um, and I think for the first like three months, it was kind of all that. It was like all me going into a session or talking to my parents and trying to find the exact right hill to die on so that my OCD could continue. Um, and so that I could, I could like press each person's buttons in just the right way so that I wouldn't have to do an exposure. Um, and I think at some point I just like, no one gave up on me so much (laughs) that I, I started to have to do these things. Um, and I, a lot of people talk about like, or Ethan mentioned ACT. And for me, I, I needed to do exposure therapy before I could find any value in ACT, um, pun intended. Um, I, like, I, I wouldn't have been able to understand ACT or apply it in any way because my OCD was just getting in the way too much of my cognitions. Mm. Um, And then once I like broke away just a little bit, then I understood like what a value is and why that might be helpful in me moving through treatment. But I really needed Katya to like take the reins almost and like me to just have some level of trust in her that she wasn't going to lead to my demise. Um, And I guess once I gave up like that slightest bit of control, that's when I turned the corner. And after that, it, it was still a lot of bargaining. It was still a lot of pain. The trenches still weren't fun. Um, but I, I guess I just got, I don't know. I accepted that it was going to be a a bad six months and, and bad in the sense that I'd be anxious. Um, but mm. as Katya says, long or short-term pain for the long-term gain. And at some point that became more important to me than my OCD. Yeah. I'll tell you two cute stories if I may share on Kyle. Yeah. And if I, if I, if I show you, I have like a, uh, a, 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 a secret uh, kind of um, uh, album of Fine. pictures, and I I com- I I actually save the pictures of of them in in the in our server of like Kyle singing and doing certain things, and I I think I showed you like he ha- his voice hasn't even changed yet, so he has a little tiny voice. He looked like Justin Bieber with the hair. He's playing the guitar. It was the cutest you know the cutest thing. And like I collect the pictures, almost like a parent would collect pictures of their kids. And I go back to them. And and Ethan also like Ethan at camp like going. It's it's a fantastic like video of him like uh, going around and and climbing the walls and 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 all of that. But um, I, I'll tell you a funny story because you know listen we are clinicians but we are people. And uh, and two stories that, about those two guys that are funny. So um, I, uh, uh, Kyle and I and Ethan also, we all live in the same kind of vicinity, the same community. And one day uh, I met, a, it was the bar mitzvah time where, you know, Kyle was 13 years old. And uh, this is after camp, right? Kyle, I think camp had happened already. I think it I think we, so. Yeah. So, so Kyle and I were in a good place, you know, Kyle uh, uh, at the camp after many, many battles and and listening to a lot of like Kyle's, you know, harsh abuse about like how disgusting, how hateful, how, you know, and we hang in that. <laughs> that's all good. That's all good. And we hung in there together and like, I'm sorry you feel this way, but we're gonna do it anyway, but we're gonna do it anyway. Don't take it personally as a clinician, you know, hate the 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 game, not the player. Mm-hmm. So I was all good with that. Um, and I believe that that was part of his process, right? That eventually that was going to resolve itself. And that was kind of like a, a you know, if you want to be more analytic, a defense to protect OCD. And I'm not going to listen to to that. So I, I couldn't care less. Like you could question me, call me names. As long as you're going to do your work, that's all good with me, right? And, and And clinicians in general look at that as like part of the treatment, right? But but the funny thing is like Kyle had in the at the camp run after me one day, like you know he was a peanut like little guy. But he was very tall now. I was even much taller than him at that time. And he turns to me and really quickly goes like, uh, "Moritz, I love you," and ran away. You know, like remember that Kyle? 
Like, you're at, you're at, <laughs> I like, can't say I do, but it's an and, interesting and, thing. Yeah, but you know, in the moment, it was during the camp and during after you did all the hard exposures and you were feeling better and you were interacting and you're having a fun time. And you did that. And, and that moment, I'll never forget. For Kyle, may have been just like he said it, but I, for me, it was like, you know, it's all worth it, right? I mean, it's not only worth it because it's going to get better, but I think he recognizes that we are here to help him, right? Um, but then what happens is a few, maybe a few weeks and months later, I'm at a bar mitzvah of a friend of mine. And all of a sudden, from the corner of my eyes, I see Kyle walking in with his posse. He had a bunch of kids with him, and he's at this bar mitzvah. He walks by a kid and I saw the kid as I walk into the place and I was like, oh, Kyle is here. Uh, this is going to be interesting because this kid, I know what Kyle is going to do. So I'm sitting with my husband who has no idea who Kyle is. He doesn't know. He thinks I work for the FBI because he doesn't know anything about who works with me, what they do or whatever. All of a sudden, Kyle comes with his entire posse and there's a bunch of 13 year olds behind him. And he says, uh, first of all, Moritz, Moritz. I was like, oh, hi. And my husband's like, mm, I don't know what this is, right? And then he's like, um, this kid is trying to pick a fight. What do we do? Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, okay, Kyle, you know, go talk to someone and everything. And then two minutes later, come Kyle, pale, look at me and say, I need to talk to you, Moritz. I need to talk to you. I'm like, uh, excuse me. So I go to the corner. I'm like, what's up, Kyle? He's like, I need my mom to come pick me up. I'm really anxious. This kid is here. Like, Kyle, hang in there. We could do this. So all of a sudden, in the middle of the bar mitzvah, Kyle and I are having this conversation about how he's going to have to stand strong and have fun at a party while he is really triggered. Like, he was really triggered at this moment. Remember, Kyle? Remember? Yeah, I remember now. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, Kyle, don't leave. Don't call your mom. Please stay here. I'm, look, I'm here. I'm I'm. Well, go to the dance floor. Let's go. Like, do what you need to do, right? So it was a very interesting moment because it's how the life and the world kind of mesh together, like your work and you know what you do. And, and, and to say that you are always a clinician and you're always you're always on call, you know, and you can't say, oh, it's I'm here. I'm at a bar mitzvah for my kids, my friend's kid. I'm I'm here, and no matter what happens, I'm still here to do my job, you know. And I think that that's work. If you love what you do, you don't mind doing it all the time, you know? So I think that that's what it was. It's weird hearing it from your perspective, because I remember, like, in that moment, I, like, I didn't once consider, like, oh, you know, Maritz isn't on the job right now. Like, I should probably handle this myself. I was like, no, my therapist is over there. I'm going to talk to her. <laughs> and, and you said that in front of all your friends, which was like, oh, my God, what do I do now? Right. So that was very cute because it's like, I don't care. Guys, this is my therapist. And I was like, oh, hi. Uh, I, I don't know what to do now. <laughs> it was so cute. It was amazing. Right. And, and, and I think that those stories are interesting. And for Ethan, uh, I mean, I could give you like hundreds of stories about Ethan. You know, Ethan had the, the funniest, uh, I think, um, kind of a uh, course of treatment because there was so much drama commotion i mean every day was like ethan's day right at the clinic like what is ethan gonna do next <laughs> and right and like it was like so many things and we are trying to get creative as ethan is getting creative right so he'll get creative and we're like oh let's one up on ethan let's go you know like we are trying to figure it out how to do this um, but there were so many moments. And one that comes to mind is I'm out um, on a Sunday trying to get a TV. And my uh, youngest son at that time, he was only, you know, he's 19 now, but he was six years old. And we are uh, at a store and his name is Ethan. And Ethan uh, had a, a an event where a printer flew from flew by itself from a shelf and hit him in the head. So not out of nothing. This thing hit him in the head and he needed to go to the hospital because he needed a CAT scan because he thought he had a brain bleed. And we had made like so many like uh, contracts. And I'm like, Ethan, if you do this, you if you go, you are not going to get care, you know, and all of that. And at that moment, you know, we need to be strong. Like someone has to be strong and say, hey, this is not going to work. If you're going to do that, you're going to have to make a choice. Either you listen to OCD or your life is going to be terrible and, you know, it's going to be misery. So you're going to need to to take this this feeling. So so I'm like, 
uh, I, I move away from my family and I'm like, Ethan, blah, 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 blah. Ethan, listen, if you do this, blah, 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 blah. And every time I would say Ethan, my son would like, what? And from the other side, he would hear the name Ethan and he would turn around. And then I'm like, all of a sudden, like, and Ethan was like, I'm going to the hospital right now. I'm getting another CAT scan. I need to. Um, my brain is bleeding. I'm dying. I'm dying. It flew from the thing. I'm like, Ethan, you can't. It happens. Yeah, you know how printers are. See, a printer, and like it's a pr printer with wings. And it, No, and it, earthquakes in South Florida is a big thing, you know. Exactly. So, so I'm like, I never forget this as long as I live. So I am like, I stop. I turn around, go away to a corner, and I'm like, I'm laying on Ethan. I'm like, Ethan, I'm going to tell you right now. If you want to continue treatment, you're going to have to rely on us to make this decision right now. I want you to take a chance that maybe the printer did hit your head and maybe, but you're going to have to live with that doubt. And if you go and get reassurance now and compulse, it's only going to make this worse. So, and I'm like, Ethan, I'm telling you right now, I'm not kidding you. And so all of a sudden I feel like a, someone tugging on my leg, right? And so I turn around, I look down and my son looks at me. He's like, mommy, I think you're being too harsh on the other Ethan. <laughs> And uh, and from there on, uh, later on, Ethan and I had that conversation. Those are the behind the scenes conversation you have 10 years later. And he nicknamed my son the little Ethan and he was the big Ethan, right? Um, and, and, it, and I think that that's the moment where you realize that those guys mean so much to all of us that they kind of like a part of, they become part of your life, even though you're protecting their confidentiality and you're trying to have that boundary between your work and your life. When you have very severe cases, you know, you're a doctor, you're on call. You have to take the call. You have to partake. You have to listen to it. You have to, you know, if there is an issue at a party or if there is an issue on a Sunday, you know, it's part of it. And I think that thinking OCD treatment without that, that is really like a once a week in the office, I, I don't believe that that's going to really work. Mm. Definitely not for cases that severe. Yeah. yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. yeah. If it is severe, it won't. Yeah. It won't. No. No, of course. So Ethan, it'd be good to get uh, your side of things from going through ERP, you know, when you didn't like it and then when you saw the benefit in it. Yeah, for sure. I actually, I wholeheartedly agree with Kyle that, you know, the ERP had to come first before the act, you know, uh, really set in. For me, I learned, at least for me, that later on that there's a difference between desperately wanting to get better and doing what it takes to get better. I didn't realize those were two different things. I, I wanted to get better more than anyone, but I wanted somebody to save me. I would go to the office every day saying, Dr. Moritz, take this away. Like in my head, it was like, just can you reach in and grab it and take it away? Um, so ERP, you know, I did it. I did it because that's what I was supposed to do, but I white knuckled. I, I never, I never really bought into it. You know, I, I, I just, I really, in my head, just wished for a silver, silver bullet, some magic thing to take it away. And 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 her office was the most comfortable place, even though I was always miserable there because I just really wanted somebody to fix me. I didn't, I I didn't think I could fix myself, you know. Mm -hmm. Um. So that was the majority of my experience until you know the intervention later. Um, in Boston, where I was put in a position where life had to be more important than the OCD. Um, I wasn't being taken care of. Uh, I wasn't, nobody was bringing me food. Nobody was paying my bills. And I had this realization that, oh crap, no one's coming for me. Like I'm laying in a room in a strange house that I was renting on the South side of Boston. And if I continue to lay here, I'm literally going to die. I haven't eaten in six days. Like no one's, and I realized that, oh, I have to do this. I, I have to make the choice to get up and move forward. You know, the amazing thing is the treatment for OCD is all about uncertainty, you know, embrace the uncertainty, all this uncertainty. And I had this realization. It's like, oh, crap. The one of the only certainties in life is that, like, if you listen to OCD, it will take your life. So, yeah, suddenly, suddenly the certainty of of listening to OCD and it definitely just taking everything from me and the possibility that I can gamble and maybe it will, or maybe it won't. Suddenly the maybe will, maybe it won't seem like a much better option. Like, let me run toward the fire. Maybe I'll get through it. Maybe I won't, but that at least I have an hope and a chance. And that's when I was really uh, able to embrace 
ERP and run with it and buy into it and be willing to scare the crap out of myself in order to get there. The one quick, quick point I want to make is I love this podcast and these people because I think there's a lesson here, right? I'm a cautionary tale. Kyle is a beautiful story. We're both beautiful stories. But what I mean by that is, you know, after 30 years of of suffering and not getting the right treatment, this is what it took for me to get better. You know, Kyle, to my understanding, at least through OCD, you know, did everything outpatient over the course of years. It took time, right? But he didn't didn't require him to go to residential, didn't require him to, you know, be cut off from his family and all this extreme stuff, right? And so it's amazing to Kyle's point. We're now here in the same place. We we our paths converged into advocacy and helping others and following our dreams and goals, but our paths were very different. For me, Kyle's a beacon of hope for, you know, kids today and younger people that can get treatment earlier and, and be able to reach a place in their life much, much sooner where he didn't have to give up on college. He didn't have to give up on certain things. You know, I think that's beautiful. So um, I, I very much see Kyle as, as, you know, um, I just want to make it clear that like my path is by no means anybody's path. You don't have to reach some awful bottom. Um, Mm. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Really important point. Early intervention is crucial in anything. Um, but especially this. Um, so look, uh, guys, uh, I could ask you a million more questions, but unfortunately we've run out of time. But I just wanted to thank you all for sharing and uh, it's really interesting hearing all, all of your sides of this. Thank you. Thank you, Stu. Thank you for listening to this week's podcast. And thank you to our Patreons who helped make this episode possible. And if you would like to find out more about Patreon and the rewards and benefits, then there will be a link in the episode description. If you enjoy the OCD Stories podcast and would like to support us with a one-time tip slash donation, please go to theocdstories.com forward slash support. All tips, no matter how large or small, are greatly appreciated. Please subscribe and rate the show wherever you listen to the podcast. So thank you to MBI for supporting our work. And if you would like to find out more about their intensive outpatient services or the ranch, head to mbiwestern.com or the link will be in the episode description. And quick disclaimer, guys, this podcast is not therapy. It is not a replacement for therapy. Please seek treatment from a trained professional. And until we speak, take care.